Um, so, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll start now uh, this evening's uh, presentation. So, my name is Michael Goss. I'm chairman of the Civil Division here in Engineers Ireland. Um, just before we start, can I just do a bit of housekeeping? Can you put your phones onto silent there? And in terms of fire safety, there's no drills uh, scheduled for this evening. And there's two fire exits, the door you came through, and then this door down here in the far corner. Um, uh, tonight's event is, is or presentation is being co-hosted between the Civil Division and the Geotechnical Society of Engineers Ireland. Uh, the title of this evening presentation is uh, Engineering Constraints and Solutions in Underground Projects in German Urban Areas. Um, and I suppose that's quite pertinent considering the announcement there of uh, the Metro project and uh, commitment there to advance that scheme. Uh, it brings me great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce our speaker. His name is Michael Luffla. I hope I've got that correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, he is a geotechnical and structural engineer with over 25 years experience um, in working on geotechnical and structural design of tunnels and underground infrastructure. Um, he works with CDM Smith. He's based in Germany um, and he's worked in, on geotechnical projects in over 20 countries, including Ireland. Um, so it's uh, it's great that you've uh, come over here uh, to, to, to to undertake this presentation. Um, I think it's the only reason you're coming over here, isn't that right? Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I think the presentation is going to take about 40 minutes, and then uh, Michael will take down questions afterwards. And uh, because we're on webcast, we'll we'll uh, bring the mic around, and if you can just say your name and the organisation that you're affiliated to uh, when you're asking the question. So without further ado, I'll let Michael start. Uh, can you give, just give him a warm welcome there at the start? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for inviting me to give this presentation here at uh, Engineers Island. Um, yeah, I'm talking today about engineering constraints and solutions in underground project in German urban areas. Um, and I brought three examples with me. The Metro Line U5 in Berlin, the North South Line in Cologne and the Metro Verhahn Line in Düsseldorf. Why I've chosen these three projects? All inner city projects, really in, in really urban areas, and um, all at least partly done. So we really talk about something that has happened already and we know that it was successful. Let me start with the Metro Line U5 in Berlin. Uh, giving you an overview of the, the entire project. This is the closure between the already existing U5 in the east, east of the Alexander Place, in the east of, uh, former east of Germany, and the Brandenburg Gate, where the tunnel ended because there was a wall before. Um, as you can see, there's a length of 2.2 kilometers uh, with four underground stations and one switch station. But today, I would like to go to the to the extreme west and talk about the first station that is not on this slide here. That is the the station Brandenburg Gate that was done just before starting the construction of this uh, entire U5 line. Was it still under construction? And I said I want to talk about something that is finished that we really can say it was successful. We go to the U55 as it was called, the Brandenburg Gate subway station. This is a photo from the construction site, and you can see the Brandenburg Gate. And you can see that the, the pit, or one of the pits, is really within the center of the city, just in front of the Brandenburg Gate uh, and other famous buildings, especially in this case, the Hotel Adlon on the left side, um, which was very important for the choice of the, of the methodology that, we, that we've chosen for this project. Um, as you can see on the next slide, um, because it was pretty new at that time, and of course it is a, the, the most famous hotel in Berlin in this area, and all the politicians and, and very important persons go to this hotel, and they said it is impossible that we have a huge open pit in front of our hotel such a small pit as we now have had in front of the hotel is acceptable, but nothing more. Um, and that's why we've chosen uh, as methodology 
two open shafts cut and cover and a ground freezing new Austrian tunnel method tunnel in between. And you see the surrounding with embassies and uh, important buildings of the German government um, and of course this Hotel Adler. So very uh, unique site for, for such a construction site you can imagine. Um, what was special here in, in the, or what, what was the, the main constraint in Berlin for this project? Of course, such a long, NAT, long NATM tunnel using ground freezing, but of course the main issue was the drilling because we have a mixture of soil. We have sand and gravel with boulders, we have marl, we have silt, so we have nearly everything, every kind of soil, and of course that was a big constraint for, for the drilling for the freezing. And as you see on this picture, um, in the end, we chosen micro tunneling as the preferred solution for these freeze pipe drillings. Why? Because of the boulders and the different soil types, we found that HDD is not sufficient for this kind of drilling, and that's why we, we've chosen um, the micro tunneling. Introducing you into the sequence that we chosen for the construction of this station, um, starting with an inner circle, froze this inner circle and then started with the construction, a longitudinal NATM uh, excavating with a shotcrete lining support and after that, before starting the rest of the station, really finalizing the final lining of the construction of the, of the, of the, the station uh, for structural reasons, because such an, a big hole opened under support of ground freezing is not that easy, and that's why we um, found it necessary to have this final lining, to have a strong support in the middle, um, to be able to open uh, both sides. And that, of course, is then the next sequence, to, to freeze the outer rings, uh, and the main constraint during this phase, of course, was that we have these micro tunnels in our excavation uh, area, and it was important that we had a technique that we can um, demolish them during the excavation, um, and the excavation, we make the excavation as easy as possible. Um, you can see on this slide it is water filled. Indeed, it was, of course, warm water filled to, to have the chance to um, warm these. Um, steel pipes to get them uh, as easy out as possible. Um, and that's what we did. So this was uh, with warm fluid and the, the rest was of course with cold fluid. And then after that you can uh, do the rest of the excavation on both sides, remove the micro tunnels in the excavation area, do a shot field lining at, uh, as temporary support, and then of course construct the final lining and the station is more or less done. What is important if we talk about such a construction methodology, so ground freezing, but that is maybe the same for every other type of methodology. There are two things that I want to um, focus on. First thing is a proper <coughs> investigation of soil on site and in the lab. This is just an example for what we did, but that is vital for the success of a, of a project is to have a proper investigation. This is, for example, um, a, a frozen clay sample before testing and after failure, just to give you a reminder that this is really vital for the success of, of, a, of a project, such a project, to have um, a good soil investigation, ground investigation, lab testing, everything that, is, uh, that goes with that. And the other thing, of course, is monitoring during construction, as important as uh, the investigation before. And that is an example of what we did the, with the ground freezing. So a lot of cross sections along the tunnel line that were monitored with temperature monitors, with deformation monitors, um, just to make sure that we always knew what we did and where we were, and uh, that we really had the, the, the complete control about, about what, what we did. 
that as a, as a cross section showing you um, the drillings that were, were done uh, to have a cross section with proper mo uh, monitor. So 60 thermocouples per cross section. So uh, really good equipment to know exactly what, what to do and wh where we are and how to interpret this um, data to, to, to know that we are really on a safe site during construction. And on the longitudinal, or on the, on the plan view, you see how many thermocouples for the freezing we have inside the microtonal tubes together with that freeze pipes. And um, these number of 770 pieces of uh, thermocouples, of course, uh, a huge number to, to monitor, to control, but uh, absolutely required to have the, the complete picture about such a, such a project and to be sure that you're doing the right thing. You can see here that you can place them inside your microtunnel um, and then of course they're with cables, they're connected to a computer and you can monitor that online, uh, what is right now I guess state of the art. Some pictures to give you an impression how it the excavation went so that is uh, on the side one of the side tunnels you see here the um, micro tunnel tubes that we had to demolish during the excavation worked out pretty fine you see here this is frozen soil so the, this kind of sand and gravel um, yeah that's how it looks like so it's a, it's a huge huge excavation area uh, only supported really temporary by ground freezing and of course after that by, uh, by shot creep. The other side of that of that same tunnel, you again you see here the the tube, the micro micro tunnel tube. So impressing um, hole that you can construct only with the support of these frozen ground, and in the end then of course the shot creep. That's how it looked like uh, when we did we finished the temporary lining and then we could start with the final lining. So that's about the Brandenburg Gate Station in Berlin. And that's how it looks like today. So it's in operation. You can go there, you can enter the metro. It's done. Um, and I guess you uh, won't recognize uh, it when you see that open excavation area. And now it's really a nicely done station. Welcome to Berlin and um, yeah, go there and see it. Next I want to talk about is uh, the north-south line in Cologne. Um, uh, one of my biggest projects, to be honest, so working on that for, for many, many, many years. So it's nearly uh, twice as long as the Berlin uh, subway. Um, you see a lot of stations, seven underground stations. And when you see these huge numbers of support measures with diaphragm walls, especially 30,000 cubic meter of grouting and 35,000 cubic meter of ground freezing, you can imagine that there are some stories to tell. And I could tell you a story about all of these stations, but of course, that's, I don't have the time for that. But um, as the city of Cologne decided to choose an architect for each of these stations, so a different architect for each station, you can imagine we had really huge stations underground, and most of them were really constructed underground with just a very limited pit, and all the rest was done underground, really amazing. Uh, if you see now the stations, that really is something very special. But as I have, of course, limited time, I, I go to the, to the uh, absolute north of this um, project here, uh, we go in detail. This is the Breslau Platz, so the only station in this very small northern lot. Um, but this was a very unique site because you see here the main station of Cologne. This is the Cologne Cathedral. This is the Philharmonic Hall. This is a museum, so uh, very special. <laughs> and you see we have, uh, a, this, is, this red one is a TBM tunnel ending just in front of that uh, museum. And this is what I will focus on in my presentation. That is uh, tunneling with compressed air. 
ending, of course, in an open pit again. So why compressed air in this area? And there's something that, you f that I experience in several projects that sometimes, um, as we know that we need a very long planning and design phase for such a metro, people know already that there will be a metro in former times and decide to do measures for the later metro. What they did in Cologne that way, when they constructed the museum, they brought in two diaphragm walls uh, as support for this excavation. But as always, I would say, 10 or 20 years later, things changed. And the cross-section of, of a modern tunnel is bigger than uh, considered w back then. Why? Because we are, as I said, pretty close to a concert hall. We're under a museum, so noise reduction is a big issue, of course. Uh, and that's why we needed more space for our uh, subway in this area, so the cross-section was bigger, diaphragm was there, and then, of course, the, you face the problems that the, uh, the diaphragm walls are not sufficiently reinforced for that level of excavation. Um, and of course, you end up pretty close to the bottom of your diaphragm wall, what is not that nice at first, because you need additional strutting. Uh, and that gives you some gray hair, I can tell you. But that's why we're engineers, so we find the solutions. Um, and you see here, that, and I will show you that in the um, horizontal uh, section after that, um, or longitudinal section after that, different phases where you have to find out what is the right m method to do the strutting, to do the excavation, in which steps. Um, and there are two things that are governing these design. Of course, you want to have as uh, low pressure as possible, possible because the higher the pressure is, the, lim the more limited are the working hours in this area and the time that you need to bring the people in and out. And on the other hand, you must be always able to use your excavator because you don't want to excavate by hand. So that is something, something uh, else that you also have to consider. And that leading uh, led us to these faces that I now will present us, uh, will present you to, to show what we did, to, uh, that you know where we are. This is the open pit Kurt Hackenbeck Platz, so the, the yellow one in the overview. This is the uh, area where we use the compressed air. Here over that, this is the foundation of the museum and the concert hall. And this is a big grouted block uh, where we end it. It is done from an from a underground cavern, uh, very difficult, but successful and this dotted line down here this is the bottom of the existing diaphragm walls and you see on the at the diaphragm wall on this this pit that this is way deeper so of course that is the new one and this are these are the existing ones so and if we now go uh, on in our sequence first of all you have to do excavation as deep as you can without any strutting uh, lowering the, the water level with your compressed air to a level as high as possible for a dry excavation, what we did here. Uh, and then continue, of course, with the strutting, going backwards, and always keeping in mind that this one must be high enough to enter with an excavator, of course, uh, because that is important, because as I said, you don't want to do all the excavation by hand. And these are these circles just uh, giving the dimensions for the excavator to be sure that we always are able to work with machines uh, and then continue and of course lowering step by step the water with that to have always the, the best solution in as little compressed air uh, level as, as possible and uh, also uh, being able to do the excavation. So I go through these phases pretty quickly you see, and then you start with the final slab. Of course, that is an important point because that gives you more safety. And then 
the walls, we have to restrut and then go up with the walls, do the ceiling first and then do the la uh, as last um, sequence, the closure between the ceiling and the upcoming walls. And then you can open the tunnel and this is done successfully too. Also here I, will, I would like to end with a picture showing you what it's all about. That is during tunneling that is now uh, under compressed air. That what, what you cannot see, but I can tell you if you work in this area, you will feel it. That is um, a special way to work. Okay, that is about the north-south line in Cologne. Coming to Düsseldorf, the Wehrhahn line. Also starting with an overview, um, it is nearly as long as Cologne, so 3.4 kilometers. Also center city, you see the, the River Rhine also close to the, to the city, pretty much the same as um, in Cologne. And that is something special for both projects. The River Rhine has a very, very huge difference in is the maximum and is minimum water level because we, we talk about more than 10 meters of difference. Um, that, of course, is very important and is in a governing issue for, for the design and, and the construction of such, such a project um, because it can really vary uh, a lot. Um, in this project, I want to focus on uh, the department store Kaufhof. And Kaufhof, I made, made notice, is the same as you have here, Brown Thomas. I was <laughs> I was told so that just that, that you know what, what what Kaufhof is. So that is a German uh, department store, um, and you see that is a very historical building, a huge historical building. Um, so where the tunnel, uh, an existing tunnel, ends just in front of that building, and underneath this historical. Uh, building this, this department store, uh, the city of Düsseldorf wanted to construct a new station. In the beginning, when they started with the um, design, the first design concept um, was that they planned to do a slurry wall around this historical building uh, having the chance to dewater this area and then do uh, a lot of jet and condensation grouting underneath the existing building. Um, of course, from the, the basement of this building and then do tunneling in between uh, with ongoing compensation grouting um, and other things. Um, so very complicated. And the plan was to have the, the tunnel constructed just below that historical building and here. In the end, everybody found that there must be a better solution, to be honest, than this, because grouting itself it has its risk, um, but especially, of course, working from this historical building was not the preferred solution, and doing the tunneling um, between these grouted columns and um, other things in the ground were not really the preferred option. So in the end, it was chosen to do it differently, that to have two shafts on either side of this building and do it also with ground freezing just below that um, department store. The only thing that was kept from the original design was the compensation grouting, as you see here, and that is exactly that uh, department store. So that was done, it was the first measure that, that we really did, the, the compensation grouting, because we know that there would be freezing and tunneling after that, uh, and that's why we decided, let's start with the compensation grouting, uh, have a preheave to uh, compensate the expected uh, settlements during, especially during the tunneling. Um, and this was done not only at this point, but at other, uh, uh, below other facilities or who were really um, in, in or are 
limited or allowed limited uh, deformations. So there we did this um, compensation grouting uh, also for the TBM drive. But here it was done for the NATM drive and the uh, ground freezing. And this is how this, this works, this compensation grouting. I don't know how fami familiar you are with, with uh, compensation grouting in, in Ireland. Um, it is now done quite often in Germany and it's, it's really um, a locally controlled injection with cement or with a cement grout to produce fractures in the soil with high pressure to um, really have movements to, to, to have heave or to control sediments um, and of course to improve the stiffness of the soil. Very effective because that is a, a really something that you do from the monitoring, you see the settlements and you can react at once. So um, you can do that all the time th uh, through your construction sequences. Um, what was done, and that is just an example to show you what, what we did. This is a, these are the settlements, so that is heave as you see. And um, as I showed on a, on a earlier slide, the maximum heave was defined with 1.5 centimeters. Uh, and with the grouting, they managed exactly to come to this value, um, 1.5 centimeters heave before we started with the tunneling. Um, and that is the grouting volume that we, we use here in several steps to make sure that we have exactly what we, what we plan to, to have. That's how it looked like under these department store. So you see from the geometry and the limited space that we had in the inner, inner city place, uh, a lot of different techniques were used. Of course, these open pits done with diaphragm walls on both sides. Um, then we have a uh, jet grouted block here. That's the only thing where no other chance was. And of course, we have a lot of ground freezing underneath this department store for the tunneling. There you see then as a cross section, the, the, the it's pretty much the same as we had in Berlin, so also a, a huge hole below this department store. Um, and this is a, a cross section s showing you the dimensions. And you see here the diaphragm wall for the for the lawn shaft is just pretty close to the to the existing historical building. Um, in some parts, it was only 45 centimeters from uh, the outer edge of the diaphragm wall to the wall of the historical building, and it really worked out very very well because we lost one one broken window glass. That's all. Yeah. So it is really feasible. Of course, this building was protected, but uh, that's really feasible. Pretty, pretty close to this historical building. And this is a, it's a very uh, deep shaft. As you see, it was required to do here, uh, for structural reasons, a, a jet grouting slab, just to, to keep it stable during excavation. And this is now the launch shaft then for uh, the tunneling. You see here, especially a, a deeper excavation for uh, the drillings that were required and on top and you see from the, from from the soil it is sand and gravel on in the upper part and in the lower part it's it's fine sand so that's typical for the rhine along the rhine to have this kind of soil and that's how it looks like you see we, we just below the foundation uh, the, the frozen soil body really, that we talk about centimeters between uh, the foundation and the, fr the, the frozen soil. So just enough space for the compensation grouting pipes, uh, really uh, not much between. And looking at these picture, you see on the left the, the groundwater tables, the different ones, what I talked about, so very different uh, from maximum to minimum level. And as usual during construction you're not lucky because what we faced during construction was usually like but in this case we we didn't we had a very low groundwater table 
And of course, if we talk about ground freezing, you like to have water. Because for structural reasons, you need water to have a sufficient frozen soil body. So we had to decide to have additional drillings on both sides of our outer circles, these ones here, to have the chance to raise the water level for these parts where, which were now above groundwater level. Uh, what of course you can freeze, but uh, not with a sufficient strength then. So that's how it looked like. We that that what was frozen. What uh, all the freeze pipes were uh, switched on that were be definitely be no below groundwater level, and only the ones here on on both ends uh, above the groundwater level were also switched on, because they are not part of the of the real structure. Or the, or the structural support for the tunnel, they are only for water tightness to give us a chance to have a like a, like a basin to raise the the groundwater table in between. And that's what we did. See, just filling water in, it's really not more because on both ends you have the diaphragm wall, what is nearly watertight, and of course ground freezing is 100% watertight, never less than that. Um, so it was able to raise the ground for the table and do a proper freezing also in these parts which was above the groundwater level before uh, so give us a sufficient structural support for this um, excavation and then same as in Berlin we start usually start in the middle do the excavation and um, these are the, the typical faces you see that is first frozen on the on the edge to get the to keep up the, the water level do the, the middle tunnel heading and then of course have the final structure that is from the system the same as we did in Berlin the final structure already done and then can open the the side tunnel and finish the, the station so what is the lessons learned or what, what is the ex experience from, from, from these project ex examples. Um, choice of techniques. So we have a lot of different tef techniques in our, in our, uh, on our shelf, I would say. Um, and that is the clue for a successful project to, to come to the right s solution of, of, of techniques. Of course, governed by a rigorous ground investigation and of course uh, the constraints that we find in the ground um, man-made or natural both um, of course existing buildings sometimes even linked to to permission or the chance to get permission for something and of course uh, what we find uh, are kinds of soil Safety, of course, is a big issue because, especially when we talk about a metro, a lot of people using this metro, uh, and safety should be considered really um, highly during construction stage, but also during operation stage. Yeah, uh, both things are very, uh, very, very important. And of course, I would not say everything is possible, but much more is possible as we see how the technique developed, o developed over the last 10, 20, 30 years. So today we have really a lot of um, techniques that are really approved to, to work fine. Uh, let's use them, let's find the right one, and then we will be su successful. Thank you for your attention. So I'm just going to open up the floor there. If you've got any uh, questions, could you just uh, state your name and the organization? Um, I'd just like to thank Michael for an excellent presentation there. Uh, I knew in the title it said constrained, but I didn't know how constrained <laughs> these sites were. Um, <laughs> very fascinating. Um, just from my own perspective, uh, um, I was just wondering, the, the design of, of this, the development of design, was it employer designed or was it was it was it delivered as part of the the award of the contract during no, no, the it, it was employer uh, uh, conceptual design by the employer yeah. and then uh, the detailed design by the contractor, contractor. Okay. and was there very much variance between those two two, two phases of the project um, sometimes yes 
sometimes not so, depending on how close the employer's uh, design concept was to the limit, let, let me say like that, occurs. Um, in Germany, it sometimes is the philosophy to leave some space for the contractor. Uh, and if you, if you don't, you end up in your solution. Hello, Michael. Uh, Paul Quigley from GDG. So it is taken by, by drilling, as you do for a uh, regular soil investigation, so that is just exactly the same. Um, depending, of course, on the, of the, on the type of soil, you have uh, undisturbed or disturbed samples, so you never will have an a undisturbed uh, sand sample. But no problem, you can do that, uh, remold that in, in the lab if you know your density, and then you prepare um, samples, usually diameter of 10 centimeters and height of 20 centimeters and freeze them, and then you do the testing. And is there any loss in, in, in the extreme soil samples that are not going to find this condition? Is there any issue in terms of the surviving expansion during the freezing affecting the, 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 the stress and the... That is, of course, depend depending on the type of soil. So there's no problem in sand and gravel. So the, the strength behavior before and after freezing is pretty much the same, not changed by the freezing. It's different if you talk about silt or clay that could be impacted, of course, by freezing. Yeah, and then, of course, you have to investigate also the thought sample to find out uh, how the soil uh, behavior changes with the freezing or after the freezing. And of course, when we talk about uh, silt and clay, we have to consider also, of course, frost heave or frost pressure, what is not the case when we talk about sand or gravel. Answer that, that your question? Any other questions? Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm very interested in what you said about compensating grouting, uh, to be frank. I'm obviously at the end of my career, but I hadn't come across it before. Could you describe, you know, in what circumstances it would best be used? I mean, I can imagine in granular soil it works well, but where is the boundary point where it just becomes, you, you know, something that is uh, won't give effective results in other words if it's largely a cohesive soil perhaps yeah um, with compensation graphing as we have we use very high pressure it is not that depending on the kind of soil because you really crack or crack the soil so you can do that with a uh, silt or clay as well as with the sand and gravel um, the only Difference then is the amount of grout that you that, that you will uh, need. Um, it is best uh, when you do a tunneling or any kind of excavation pretty close to an existing structure. Could be a bridge or could be a building, whatever. Um, then of course that it's for me one of the best ways to handle the settlements that always appear when you do underground excavation to make sure that the construction you're working at uh, is not impacted more than it should. And uh, just as one supplementary question, when you're actually doing the grouting, the, 
the technique you use? Is it just end of pipe, or is has the pipe got many holes? Yeah, you have many holes. So every 50 centimeters, usually, you have a hole. You're really able to really bring in the grout where you need it. Yes. Of course, you need a proper monitoring at your construction so that, that you do the grouting below uh, to exactly know where settlements occur so that you really can react exactly in this position where you need uh, action. And that is, that is uh, really the, the advantage of this uh, methodology that you really monitor and can act as one at, at once. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ahmed, and I work for OCSC. And so I would imagine that tunneling in rock is easier than in soils, or? So usually, working in rock, you don't have the problem with the settlements, but like you have in soft soils. Yeah. Um, I don't know if compensation grouting really is used in, in rock. I don't think so, because it is a method that is pretty linked to soft soils. Peter Maxwell from RPS. Uh, I'd just like to congratulate you on a very good, um, very interesting um, uh, presentation. Uh, my question is uh, to do with prediction of settlement. Um, what, how did you uh, predict theoretical settlement, and what measures did you use to monitor that settlement, and what provision did you have in place for for emergency procedures if if something went wrong? Um, so I hope I can answer this question in English sufficiently. Um, of course, there are different types of monitoring devices that you use. So from, um, I, don't, I don't know the, the, the English word for that, Schlauchwagen. Anybody know, knows this word? So that is a very detailed kind of, of, of monitoring device, really giving you online uh, deformation values, so that is the best that you can do in a very uh, critical or, or in a critical situation. Um, of course, you have to to do a, a regular survey, so that you that you have uh, daily data about settlements, about uh, deformation of existing buildings and, and things like that. And as I said, compensation grouting is definitely a good measure to to handle with these settlements. Um, a proper monitoring is, of course, very important. And on the other side, from the design, you must know alarm values uh, where you have to, to stop something or to, to, to start really your engineering brain when things are not running like you expect them to do. Um, of course, that you need to investigate the, the constructions that you, that you work at and find out what is allowed for settlements or reefs to prepare yourself to have alarm values and, 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 and values where you really have to stop your construction. Um, it's Michal Kalim from Arup. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I was just following on from Peter's question. It seems um, that the, the stations are quite complex, uh, both the geometry themselves the interaction with other buildings and also the construction operations. I'm just wondering about the settlement predictions and how do you simulate these uh, complex operations, for example, ground freezing? Um, of course, you do a lot of FE calculations for these stations um, to, to understand what is happening during your excavation and to really come to the uh, optimized sequence to understand how how big the uh, the, the open uh, excavation area can be uh, to be sure not to have deformations that are critical for your surroundings. Um, so m most of these things were calculated with uh, FE calculations, sometimes even with 3D FE calculations. Okay, thank you. Uh, David Gill from AGL. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I, I, I was with the ground freezing. Um, 
what sort of spacing on your the pipes for freezing um, would you typically require to let, to be effective in terms of penetrating? So if we talk about normal drillings, so mm. drillings with 100, 150 millimeters size, uh, to start a design is a rough number, one meter spacing. Is is a good number to start. So, okay. And the other thing, I was you obviously create this frozen arch of soil above your your tunnel, and and I, I suppose then, do you have a number of levels of pipes to create that arch, and then how, how thick does that typically need to be? Um, to the ratio the, the to the one in, in Berlin <coughs> that we saw was uh, two point five meters. Yeah. Um, the one in Düsseldorf was a little bit less. I think we had two meters. Uh, and does that vary for the soil type or just the geometry of the, the uh, tunnel? Everything. Does soil type, of course, uh, geometry, uh, saturation, uh, sat um, soil content. So a, a lot of things that are, uh, have to be considered during freezing. Um, we always said not less than 1.5 meters. So never do a, a frozen soil body uh, below that number even if your structure calculation shows one, one meter sh is, is sufficient, uh, but for to reduce risk, uh, we always recommend to have at least 1.5 meters, and the rest is then depending on the structural calculations to come to uh, two meters or, or more. Okay, thanks. No, sorry, Jay, I keep kicking out more questions here, but I was just one other thing, with regard to the, the soil strength for frozen soil, does that vary? I mean, I, I suppose it wouldn't be, that's not something done very commonly here, if not for a long time, I think. Uh, so, in terms of st strength of the soil, you know, with frozen water, does it vary much for a frozen block from one soil type to another? Yeah, it, it does. It does, yeah. yeah. So, you can say uh, the more coarse it is, the higher is the strength. More coarse. So right. yeah, okay. Very easy rule. So, in general, sand and gravel is a perfect soil to be frozen. Um, no frost heat, no frost pressure, uh, no problems with the thaw soil. Um, it's a little bit different if we talk about silt and clay. Thank you for your talk. They're most interesting. What was the fluid used in the uh, freezing pipes, and what temperature was it running at? Uh, in all these projects I, I, I uh, presented to you, it was brine freezing. Um, so it is uh, salty water in the end. Um, and the temperature is minus 35 degrees. Thank you. Just my own perspective, what was the construction period for the, the final uh, project there, Michael, in terms of from start to finish? That's a good question, Michael. <laughs> um, so Berlin was just the station. So just the station. Um, I guess it took two and a half years. So Cologne uh, started in 2004, seven years. Düsseldorf, I had the, the numbers, I guess also six or seven years. Okay. Yeah. So there are very prolonged periods for from start to finish. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Or sorry, I just, so the people can pick you up. Uh, Anna Boland in Tech C. Um, I'm just interested in um, when you come across a, a fractured, when you come across fractured rock in combination with gravel and and not a homogeneous soil, in other words. But um, what is your approach in design for shoring up those kind of excavations with ground freezing, if you have such a soil where you have a combination of rock, gravel, sand? And even even clay. So, so usually it is, n it is no problem to to freeze each kind of soil. Um, what you have to consider, of course, it is the difference in the f the, the required freeze up time, um, in the strength. So in, in that in the end must fit together. So that that can um, end that you. For example, in a, in, a, in a very loose strength or low strength soil, 
you need another uh, freeze pipe layout than in, in a rock formation, of course. So, but it is no problem to freeze different types of soil at the same time. So that, that, that's been done before uh, several times. And especially the, it is done, I know a project in Rotterdam where they had a, um, a pit wall frozen, of course with very different layers from uh, coarse sand to peat even, so very bad soil. Um, of course the totally different behavior frozen, but of course the, the weakest one is the governing. Yes. And you've got shear planes going on, I'm sure, when you, when you have rock, fractured rock, I'm, I'm sure that Faulting is an issue when you come across that kind of soil. So if we talk about ground freezing, it is yet, if we talk a, 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 a good rock, it's only to close the fracks so to, 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 to uh, keep off the water, of course, to have a, a watertight ex excavation. Okay. Because my expectation would be that then the structural support of the, of the ground freezing is not as good as the rock is. All right, thank you. Any further questions? I think this will be our last question, and then we'll go for a vote of thanks. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, Donald McKenna, ESP International. Uh, thank you for a very, very good presentation. I just wonder about the, is there any rule of thumb about uh, ground freezing costs in terms of overall project? Because They're you very difficult to answer, of course. Um, so ground freezing is not the cheapest methodology, um, that's for sure. Uh, it is usually chosen because it is a very safe one, especially below groundwater table, of course. Uh, and the number is really changing depending on all the conditions that you have. As a very rough number, it's something between, let's say, 500 euro per f cubic meter frozen soil to 2,000 really depending on the size, on the geometry, on the soil, on whatever. So it's really hard to say you have to investigate that in detail to, to come to a, to a serious number. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Can I ask uh, David Gill from the Geotechnical Society Chairman to uh, pose a vote of thanks? Thank you. Yeah, my, yeah th thanks very much, my, uh, Michael, for a you know, very interesting uh, talk there. I think you, you've covered um, you know, a number of techniques that probably a lot of us wouldn't be very familiar with. They're very, you know, they're innovative solutions. I mean, the issue of ground freezing, uh, the compensation grading and, and compressed air are, you know, quite unusual, certainly I think in Ireland. And, and uh, the very impressive results you've got with those, I'd say, uh, when you walk into one of those uh, tunnels that's purely supported by the frozen arch and they look like cavernous spaces, that must be a, uh, you feel confident. You have to be confident in your design to, you know, for absolutely that, to go know. there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so no. So I think that it's, <laughs> we're, you know, very much, uh, look, you know, that they're very impressive. So um, I'd like to we thank Michael in a normal way. Uh, so, so on behalf of the Geotech Society and the Civil Division, you know, thanks very much. Michael. You're welcome. Thank you. There, um, which is, sorry, just so, just, the line <laughs> just, <laughs> just to rate, just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, I suppose, just this is the next event that, uh, as a geotechnical society, we have coming up is, um, uh, uh, where have we got there? Get the page up there, yeah, um, just in, in November, uh, 15th in Port Leash, uh, we, we have a one day conference just for anyone who's interested on. Uh, it's geotechnical, geotechnical engineering for ground and surface water, and the main theme really is on, on flood defence. And um, we have the support of the OBW, OPW. We have um, a keynote speaker from the Netherlands who's speaking on the Dutch approach. Um, we're here to have also a guest speaker from the OPW, and we've got 11 technical papers from uh, people who have sub uh, submitted papers to our conference. And so, you know, as part of that day, you'll get the, the proceedings, and they cover a range of uh, uh, projects actually in Ireland and, and Germany. We seem to have some CDM Smith there have contributed to that as well. So, you know, I think if, if you have any interest in that area, um, please do come along. I think it would be a, you know, a very interesting um, uh, day. So, uh, and I'll just get the, uh, the just 
ich hoffe, er ist jetzt ein äh, Keynote-Speaker oder Keynote-Sprechen äh, gehört. Und Mark Adams ist ein Key, und dann haben wir das 10, 11 Talks. So, let's just try. Fantastic. Great. Just thank you, Wes. Thanks very much.